All righty, I'm the Samani Riverkeeper. That's a uh, project and a staff position with Walls Watershed Coalition, Inc. Hi, I'm the staff. Uh, Walls has been around since 2012, trying to keep the waters clean in the entire 10,000 square miles of the Swanee River Basin. Swanee Riverkeeper does advocacy. Sarah here, who's going to do the introduction. She's our board chair. And uh, Shirley uh, does lots of outings, including at Banks Lake, where there are bats. Susie does water quality testing, and we have, you know, Rindy Kennedy. She's both on our gala committee, and she loves to help with booths. And, oh, there's Heather. Heather is one of our speakers at our upcoming Walls River Review. That's our sit-down fundraising dinner on September 7th at the uh, Turner Center for the Arts in Valdosta, Georgia. Heather's going to be talking about forest management and water. So we have a series of Walls webinars. This is, I think, number six. And if you want to see those, go to walls.net, look under About, and then Webinars, and you'll see them. So Sarah, <laughs> our board chair, is going to introduce our speaker. All right. Today we've got Emily Farrell. She is a wildlife biologist. She's going to teach us a little bit about her favorite bats in the local area. Um, also, if you want to join us and see some bats for yourself, we have a full moon paddle every month at Banks Lake, and there's lots, lots of opportunity to see bats there. And with that, we will move on to Emily. You're on. Thank you. I will uh, get my screen shared here and y'all just tell me if you can see my PowerPoint. Let's see. I need to just do one thing. Switch my screens. I got too many screens going. All right. Let's see. Are you able to see my PowerPoint now? Yes. Yes. It is. Great. Um, well, well, did you have a question? If not, I'll get us started. No? OK. Um, um, I forgot to say that. Hold your questions to the end. If you have a question, type it in the chat so you don't forget. It. Okay, yes. now back to you, Emily. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Emily Farrell, and I am a wildlife biologist in the Wildlife Resources Division of DNR. Um, and in particular, I'm part of the Wildlife Conservation Section. So I work with non-game mammals across the state. Um, primarily, I end up working with bats, uh, but I also get to devil with some other species as well as a part of my job. And today I specifically wanted to talk to you about the bats of Georgia and try and um, just give you some more background and information about the species that we have, as well as um, kind of how they're tied to um, water um, and uh, in particular talk about some of the bat species that you might see at Banks Lake when you guys go out for those petals that you enjoy. So um, to get us going, we have 16 species of bats in Georgia. Um, and all of them are insectivores, which means that they only eat insects. Um, primarily, they prefer to eat beetles and moths, but they'll eat uh, other smaller insects, such as mosquitoes as well. Um, in other parts of the world, bats will have a much more varied diet. They'll eat frogs and fish, fruit, they'll drink blood, etc. But all of our bats here in Georgia and in the East Coast of the United States really only eat insects. Um, and bats um, are mammals. So just like you and I, they are vertebrate, vertebrate, they have hair, they give birth to live young. Um, there are over 1,400 species of bats across the world. So they're incredibly 
diverse um, and they occur on almost every continent around the world. Um, and so they're the second largest order of mammals uh, right behind rodents. So there are a lot of bats across the world um, and some of them are very specialized in the habitats they live in and some of the food sources they're using and some are much more um, generalist in what they're willing to use. Um, and the order of bats um, is Choroptera, which means hand wing. So when we look at how bats have evolved to fly, it is very similar to the way that our hands have evolved. If I had very elongate fingers with a skin membrane attached between them. So bats, when they're flying, are using their um, arms basically to fly and that they have a wrist, they have a thumb, they have fingers and very long finger bones. Um, so that is what allows them to have this ability to fly. They do not have um, hollow bones or anything like that. Um, they just have a very thin skin membrane between these very uh, thin bones. And despite that, they're actually very sturdy, um, but it is um, an interesting thing that they have evolved uh, to fly so well. Um, and when you see them flying, you probably notice that they're flying very erratically. They, they duck and dive and turn and flip over and do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and that's just because they're really trying to feed. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, because I just want to give you some background about kind of the general um, lives of bats. Many people are not familiar with our bat species. Many people don't realize how many bats are around them every day. Um, and how abundant our bats are. Um, and so the first thing I like to talk about is where they live. Um, so many people think about bats uh, living in caves, for example. And we do have caves, um, mostly in Northwest Georgia, um, where the bats like to live in, and some of the species live there year round, some of them live there part of the year. Um, we also see a lot of bats using um, dead trees or snags. They will go underneath um, bark that is starting to fall off those trees. They also live in hollowed out portions of trees. Um, and down uh, kind of where you guys are more so and down in the coastal plain, um, we do see a lot of bats using areas like marshes to feed over and get some insects, as well as roosting in things like Spanish moss and underneath um, palm fronds of palm trees. Um, so if you have a habitat like that around your home, keeping Spanish moss present on, um, on trees in your area and not removing dead palm fronds or dead trees if they're not an issue for you is a really good thing that you can do for bats locally. Um, specifically for bats that you might see when you go visit Banks Lake, um, I tried to look and see if I had any data of any uh, surveys that uh, Georgia DNR had done at Banks Lake and we have not. Um, so we are, we are having, we have a data gap in that area, which is um, something we encounter a lot with Southern Georgia because it's actually quite tricky to capture bats in South Georgia because um, there's, there's usually so much habitat available um, that it's kind of hard to funnel in and, and really have a good spot to capture them. Um, but I went ahead and, and thought about bat species that I know are likely in the area. So. Um, in particular, um, these eight species that I'm showing you here are ones that I would consider likely to be encountered in that part of the world. Um, so the northern yellow bat, um, that is one of those species that loves palm trees. Rap nest figured bat, um, that one in particular loves uh, to live in swampy habitat. Uh, the Seminole bat is a what we call a tree bat, and they'll live up and blend in really well with pine trees. Um, if you they'll People will find them roosting on pine cones. They're like the same color. Um, Tricolored bats, they'll be in Spanish moss. They'll just be in a hollowed out tree. They also like to use transportation structures like bridges and culverts. Um, evening bats um, are another one that's kind of a generalist and will use uh, hollow trees. Um, Brazilian free-tailed bats, um, we see that species in particular uh, group in large numbers, and we'll talk about them later. Um, and they're also one of our general species as our big bound bats that will live in trees, they'll live in transportation structures, they'll live in people's attics. Uh, they're pretty much willing to go almost anywhere. Um, and then southeastern bats are one of those species that are um, a little more particular and uh, likely the one I imagine. Um, the I've been told that there's a, a tree that you guys I know it changes over time, but from my understanding, there's a nice big tree that you can see a lot of bats 
uh, when you go to Banks Lake flying out of. And my suspicion, if I had to guess of what species that likely is, is southeastern bats, because um, that's very well known for that species to do that, um, or evening bats. Those would be my guesses, but obviously would need to confirm those species ID. Um, and some of these species are really um, of concern. Did you have a question? I saw a hand up. Um, I don't know if you're trying to stop me. I'll keep going. Um, for these species of concern, um, we do have um, some state protections for the northern yellow bat, rough nest figure bat, and southeastern bat. Those in yellow, those either are Georgia rare or Georgia species of concern. Um, and the tricolored bat is a federally proposed endangered species, um, and they occur statewide throughout Georgia. Um, so those are really great species to have in the area, and I hope that they are there. And I would assume at least some of these are if we really went out and took our time to do a thorough survey of that area. And what the bats are doing out there is navigating with echolocation, and this is helping them to um, move around those landscapes as well as to find their food sources. So when you see those bats, uh, erratically flying, ducking and diving. What they're doing is using those echolocation calls to generally narrow in on that insect that they're looking for, and they're gonna increase the frequency of their calls to really figure out where that insect is. And then to eat it, they're gonna use their wing and scoop it up or use their tail and scoop it up into their mouth. And that's how they're going to eat. They eat on the fly. Um, so um, that's probably the behavior that you're seeing. That's why it looks so erratic um, because that's what they're really trying to do. They're very good at being acrobatic. Um, and some of our species do hibernate in Georgia. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, some of them may be hibernating in caves in North Georgia, um, in the coastal plain region of our state. Um, we think that probably there's not a lot of long-term hibernation going on. It just doesn't get that cold for that long in the winter. Uh, bats are probably going through short periods where they go into a state of hibernation called torpor, where they're going to lower their body temperature, lower their heart rate, and just save energy and sleep for days at a time. So they're likely doing that in um, your region of the state. Um, periodically, when they gets to be really cold for you know a week or two in January or February, that's likely what they're doing to conserve energy. Um, and in that part of the state, because we don't have very many caves when they're doing this, most of our bats are probably hibernating in um, hollowed out trees or in transportation structures um, like bridges and culverts because they offer a little bit more thermal stability because of those big concrete masses getting hit by sun all day. So that's very common that we see bats using that and we do a lot of work with the Department of Transportation to try and consider bats using structures. Um, in North Georgia, we do see bats hibernating for much longer in our caves, generally entering hibernation around November and coming out around March, just depending on when it actually starts getting cold and warming up. Uh, this species in the photo right here is the tricolor bat, and that is our most common cave hibernating bat in the state of Georgia. But not all bats hibernate. Some bats do migrate, and many people are surprised by this. They think of migration in terms of birds or maybe butterflies. Many people do not think of bats, um, but some of our species do like to migrate, um, and we think that where they actually like to migrate to is southern Georgia. Um, these bats are generally going to come from further north in the U.S. or even in Canada, and they're going to then be traveling to Florida and the coastal plain of Georgia and the Carolinas, and that is where they will spend their winter. Um, so this is something that uh, we've been suspicious of for a long time and haven't had a lot of opportunity to really investigate, but it's something we're very interested in, particular for these migratory species, because we're seeing that they are being hit hard by wind energy, and we're seeing declines for some of these species with uh, wind turbines out on the landscape and these migratory species being impacted by that. So it's something that we're really trying to start investigating further of when these bats are arriving, how many, what species. Um, we have an idea of that already, but to kind of uh, get some better answers on some of these questions. Um, now our bats, do you give birth to live young? Um, generally, they're just gonna have one or two pups. Sometimes they can have three, um, and oftentimes they can be twins or triplets. Um, and when these bats are born, they're big. They're one third of mom's body weight. So one third of a, the body weight of mom for a human, you know, if, if I had a baby, it could be a 50 pound baby, right? So that's a huge baby. And it's a lot of work for these mothers to care for these pups. And they really try their best to not have to move them because it is so strenuous on the mothers to do so. Um, so we do have some protections in terms of uh, bats using structures and having to remove them and manage 
manage them in the summer when mothers are having babies because that's a very critical time for our species. Um, some species will um, roost solitarily and have these um, babies or what we call pups. Um, sometimes they will roost in groups um, like that big photo in the background you can see there. Um, that's a, a large maternity colony and sometimes we'll see thousands to even millions of moms gathering together, typically in caves, to have babies um, all at the same site. Um, and bats can live a long time. Uh, many people think of bats and they think of mice or other rodents that maybe only live for, say, one to two years. Um, the oldest known bat that we have uh, detected in the wild was 47 years old. Um, and we actually generally consider our bats are likely living in the wild 20 to 30 years. Um, so they're the longest lived mammal relative to their size. Um, and we think part of that could be due to the fact that many of them do hibernate and are able to conserve energy when they do. Um, but it's something that I think uh, most often surprises people. Many people uh, that I encounter think bats are going to have, uh, you know, 10 to 20 uh, young every year, just like rodents, um, as well as have a very short lifespan. And they're actually um, quite the opposite um, and uh, pretty amazing in that they can live for so long, given how small they are. Unfortunately, bats have a bad reputation and we get a lot of people um, that call me that have seen a bat or found a bat around their home. Um, and a lot of times they're either very scared or think bats are very gross or dirty. And I understand why um, one of the major concerns with bats being around people's homes um, is of course rabies. So bats are a rabies vector species, this is true. Um, but rabies is actually quite rare in wild bats. It's estimated that less than actually half of 1% of wild bats has rabies. So it's very unlikely that any bat that you encounter has rabies, but you cannot tell if a bat has rabies just by looking at it. So the best thing to do is to be safe and assume that any bat you encounter has potential to have rabies. And because rabies is such a deadly virus, if treatment is not sought after exposure, uh, the best recommendation we have when people encounter bats um, is to not touch them, not handle them. You're not going to get rabies from a bat flying around above your head. Um, that bat has to have um, a mucous membrane transfer to you. So typically that's a bite, or if you say had a cut on you and a bat crawled on your arm and had saliva there, but uh, you would probably know if a bat was on you. So um, bats flying around in the area, um, not a concern, um, but I understand the worry with rabies and those of us that work with bats are um, vaccinated to work with bats and have a rabies pre-exposure shot. Um, and we have to get a routine titer check to make sure that we are safe to handle our bats, even though it's unlikely that they have it. If we did have a bat that was behaving abnormally, which um, might mean, you know, laying on the sidewalk outside someone's house, that bat could be just injured. It doesn't mean it has rabies um, or it could be old or it could be a juvenile and it hasn't quite figured out how to fly. So there's a lot of potentials of what it could be. Um, but if I did have a bat that I was worried about for rabies, say a child picked it up um, and you needed to get it rabies tested, that's something that the <clears throat> county health department typically handles and it does require the bat to be euthanized, um, which is why we try and just advise people to not pick up bats if they can, because I've had people try to help bats and pick them up and they, they get bit and then we have to still euthanize that bat for rabies testing. So it is best to just not pick up bats and not handle them. Another disease concern we have with bats is histoplasmosis. Um, so this is a fungal infection that can impact people um, and it can cause uh, an infection in their lungs. Um, and it's from large quantities of bat droppings. Um, typically people that get exposed to this, um, which also you can get this from chicken droppings or bird droppings in general as well, um, are in an enclosed area um, where there's a large amount of droppings. So if you're outside or if you just have, you know, four, five, 10 bats in your site, it's probably not a concern. Um, the only case that I'm aware of of people getting it in the state of Georgia has been um, someone that was in a cave um, and there was a lot of bat droppings from it. So um, certainly uh, it's something to be aware of if I have people going into say an attic that has a large colony of bats, um, it doesn't hurt to be careful and wear a mask or a respirator, but um, it's not something um, that's very common. Um, I've been in, many, many caves and never personally had an issue with it. But of course, everyone's different. 
Um, and it's just something to be aware of. Um, and so now that we've talked about a couple of the, the negative side of bats or the side that people don't really enjoy bats um, about, I want to talk about how beneficial they are. Um, and so I thought this was a fun photo showing bats drinking water. Um, so just like you and I, they have to drink water. And what they do is they just dive really low um, over the body of water and, and just sip it with their tongue, just like many other animals would do. Um, it's just not something I think most people think about of how bats drink water. It's kind of a very specific thing to consider. Um, and so I love these photos. Um, this is looks like an Eastern red bat, which we have here in Georgia, um, getting a sip of water. Um, and so they are really reliant on that water source. And I didn't, um, I don't think I have a slide about it here, but it's been interesting um, seeing some of the more recent news that has come out related to bats and water quality. And there have been issues where there have been um, outbreaks of cyanobacteria that cause, um, you know, issues for people. If you um, go into a lake that has like blue green algae um, and consume it um, and have, um, you know, sometimes people's dogs die or things like that. People get sick, have to go to the hospital from it. Um, and that's also an issue for bats um, where we've had mortality of bats that's been linked to water quality from the water that they're drinking for things like that. Um, another concern we have with bats is, of course, pesticides. Um, I've had bats that have been roosting in fruit trees and then the trees got sprayed and then we've had bats, you know, um, become ill because of that. Um, so that's another concern we have with bats. And I know that's a big concern with a lot of water quality as well. Um, so those are two things to consider with bats and water. Um, but in terms of how beneficial bats are, they eat a lot of insects. Um, and by a lot, I mean 50 to 100% of their body weight every night. Now, if I had to eat even 50% of my body weight of food every single day, that's a huge amount of food. That's an, just, um, uh, it's pretty amazing to me that they're able to eat that amount and then fly. I mean, I just think about how much I eat on Thanksgiving and how full I feel just walking around. And then you think about eating 50 to 100% of your weight and flying. Uh, and I think it's pretty amazing that they're able to do so. Um, so when we start thinking about how many bats um, it would take to consume a lot of insects, it's really easy to start scaling up. So you can see I have here a colony of a thousand bats can consume 22 pounds of insects nightly. And some of our bats are able to travel very far um, in their consumption of food. Um, and they will eat things like mosquitoes. Uh, that's a common question. People love to tell me, love to ask me if bats will get all the mosquitoes out of their yard. And I will say that certainly if you have a large population of mosquitoes, they will help. Um, and that's something that we've seen where uh, we've had people put bat houses near their homes for that benefit. Um, but the biggest benefit that we see from bats and their insect control is to the agricultural industry, um, where it has it's estimated that bats are saving billions of dollars every year in the amount of insects they're able to control because they love to eat things like uh, corn uh, ear moths, which are really bad for your corn. So they're really good at controlling a lot of the um, kind of pest insects that um, get into our crops and get into our food supply. Um, so we're very grateful for our bats for that. And it's, um, you know, here we have the statistic of a thousand bats consume 22 pounds of insects nightly. Um, one of the things I was asked to talk about uh, or show for my presentation here was a particular roost, and that is in Douglas, Georgia. So you guys might be familiar. This is a, actually it's a fertilizer barn um, in Douglas. Um, it's privately owned. Um, we have worked with a landowner to get access to the site and, and observe these bats. Um, and I can easily tell you it's over a thousand bats. Um, the exact number is something that we're trying to figure out. Um, we have gone and visited the site. Um, the barn used to look like the image on your left side um, that they're flying out of where it's kind of the, the top of the barn was um, some of the wood had fallen off. Um, the uh, owner of the property has since redone that structure and the image on the right side that is still playing with them flying out is what it currently looks like. The bats are still there. They have no problem with it. Um, and we're, um, what we've done um, in the video you're seeing playing right now is taken a thermal image cam to try and go um, record how many bats are flying out of the structure. And then we have a software program that we're trying to get to count how many this is. Unfortunately, our software program is a little overwhelmed by this amount of bats right now. Um, we're guessing it's multiple hundreds of thousands, um, maybe, um, you know, 
500,000 to a million, we're somewhere in there. And it does vary throughout the year, of course. Um, and so it's something that we're trying to get a better grasp on. But I mean, if you think about how many insects this colony is eating a night in Southern Georgia, it's an amazing amount of food that they're able to go out and consume. And the species that we see in this site is the Brazilian free-tailed bat. Um, and they're quite an interesting species because they do form these large colonies. Um, they're the bat species that's in the Congress Avenue Bridge in Austin, Texas, that people go and watch. Um, they also have the largest bat cave in the world in Texas called Bracken Cave, and it has 20 million of these guys. Um, and my most interesting thing for this species is they're, they're not that big. They're, they're pretty small. They're like this big if you were holding one. Um, and they can fly 99 miles per hour. Um, so it's pretty amazing how fast they are and how far they're able to go out and feed. And one of the things that kind of keyed us in actually to this barn, um, because I do work statewide and I'm not able to go uh, look for bats everywhere without kind of a, a local tip, um, is that I had a, a, an individual contact DNR and, and report this to us. And at the same time, um, the Air Force uh, was monitoring radar um, for large colonies of birds and bats because they're concerned about airplanes uh, striking these animals and causing issues for the animals as well as for their planes and safety, of course. Um, and this is one that they had keyed us into as well um, because they can see this colony on radar. It's so large when they emerge every evening. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Um, to see. Uh, and it, it's interesting when you go, um, you know, I've seen other people going and standing and watching this emergence as well as um, hawks coming in because they know it's an easy meal. Um, so it's it's a pretty amazing thing to watch. It does take, I think, about 20 minutes or so um, in total. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of bats and they're eating a lot of insects and really helping us out down there with a lot of the agricultural that's in that area. Um, but unfortunately for us um, in North America and, and really all over the world, um, we're seeing a lot of declines in our bat species um, that are concerning us. So this photo right here is a Brazilian free-tailed bat. It is the one I just showed you um, in that video. And you can see they're called a free-tailed bat. They have a little tail sticking out, like a little mouse tail. Um, a lot of our other bat species um, in Georgia, well, actually all of our other bat species in Georgia do not have a tail like that. Um, they have a tail that has the... Um, membrane of the the tail going all the way to the tip of the tail so it doesn't look like it's sticking out. I know that's hard to imagine so this next photo will show you a bat that I'm, that has that. So um, this is the Raffinus big eared bat um, and you can see its tail looks a little different. Um, but this bat is one of those that I showed you earlier that you may encounter at Banks Lake um, and that is because they love to live in hardwood bottomland swamps. That's their favorite habitat. We do encounter them in other areas. Um, they are found throughout the state of Georgia in low numbers. Um, they don't form large colonies like those free-tailed bats I just showed you, um, but you can have anywhere from 20 to 50 to 80 in a site uh, generally, um, you know, and one of the preferred habitats for this bat is those swampy areas and in particular these large hollow tupelo trees. Um, that is what they love to roost in and so as trees like this are lost on the landscape because say the area is drained for uh, you know construction and development or a tornado or a hurricane comes through and damages that site or the wood is harvested or whatever it is um, they're losing that habitat that's really the preferred for these guys um, and they're one of our kind of habitat uh, specialist in that they prefer to be in these areas versus some of our more general species. And so this is an example of a species that we're concerned about as they lose that potential habitat. Um, but one of our um, big threats that we've seen in Georgia recently that is a little more specific to point to is white nose syndrome. Um, so you may or may not have heard of this. Um, it is a fungal disease. It was discovered in the state of New York in 2006. Um, and what was observed there is biologists were surveying a cave in the winter and found that bats had white fuzz on their nose, wings, and ears, just like in this image here. And they were flying out of the cave in the middle of winter, which in the middle of winter, especially in New York, those bats are supposed to be hibernating. They should be sleeping and conserving their energy. It is much too cold and there's no food available on the landscape for them to be flying around. So it's very concerning. Um, and after more investigation, we've now come to realize that this is caused by a fungus, uh, and it was uh, new to science when it was discovered. It is called Pseudogymnoascus destructans. Uh, we call it PD for short. 
And what PD does is it actually grows into the skin membrane of the bats. Um, and as it invades those skin cells, it causes irritation of these bats. It wakes them up from their hibernation and they're, um, they start losing the membrane of their skin. Um, and then they have this infection that they're fighting off. And when those bats are hibernating, when this impacts them, their immune system is weakened um, because of their hibernation state. Their body's just not uh, fully functioning and, and able to fight off things. And so this is a thing that impacts them at that time um, because the bats are staying still in a cold, damp environment for so long that it can grow. Um, and it causes the bats to wake up repeatedly throughout the winter um, and they use their fat reserves too quickly and they end up often dying from starvation. Sometimes they'll die from dehydration as they fly around in these sites. Um, but it is very concerning. Unfortunately, um, since the discovery of white nose in 2006 in the state of New York, it has now spread to almost the entire United States. It is now in 40 US states and nine Canadian provinces and it got to Georgia in 2013. Um, and when it got here, we saw that for the caves that were impacted by the fungal disease, we had over 90% of our bats die on those sites within the first year of this disease. Um, and across the range of many of our species, we've had millions of bats die um, and several species at risk of extinction. Um, this photo here is that tricolor bat I mentioned. They're a proposed endangered species because of white nose syndrome. That is our big concern where we've lost so many of them. In Georgia, we've lost 87% of them in our white nose positive caves. So um, that's for us in just North Georgia where we have white nose impacting our bats kind of in, from Athens and North or Atlanta and North from there. Um, and in the Southern half of the state, what we have is um, the spread of the fungus further south. So the fungus has been found down in the Columbus and Macon areas, and we're concerned about it moving south because there are some caves in South Georgia, not as many as there are in the north part of the state, but there are some down there. Um, and so we're worried about those caves. There's also caves in North Florida. Um, and so we're continuing to monitor bats in this southern um, half of Georgia for the spread of this fungus or impacts of the disease um, developing within sites and uh, we're really trying our best to protect the bats that are remaining there because that is kind of the last stronghold we consider for these species. Um, so for us in Georgia, our tricolored bats that are alive on the coastal plain that have never been impacted by white nose um, represent a really good portion of that population that's remaining because so many of them have died where white nose has impacted them in the rest of their range. Um, so it's very concerning for us um, and something that we actively monitor every year in Georgia working with the National Wildlife Health Center um, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And working with those agencies, there have been a lot of efforts to try and find a cure for white nose because it has been around for so long now. You know, it's going to be 20 years soon since it was first discovered. And there are a lot of things that actually kill white nose um, in a lab setting. Um, so an example here in Georgia in particular is a bacteria that's part of um, it's used in food transportation to prevent fruit from ripening. It's a volatile organic compound and it um, has been used in Georgia at a cave that used to have 5,000 tricolored bats before white nose. And then after white nose, it dropped down to 250 bats. Um, and so we have been um, testing uh, that compound in that site in recent years with Kennesaw State University uh, researchers um, across uh, the U.S., other things that are being tried are vaccine studies as well as using UV light. Um, and I mean, you could even put um, an antifungal compound. I've seen some places using like a probiotic um, that helps inhibit the growth of this fungus. There's, there's many things that will kill it. Um, the issue is uh, we have so many caves um, across the United States. Like I said, in Georgia alone, we have over a thousand caves. Um, and these bats are not easy to reach. We have caves in Georgia that are six miles long um, that have multiple passages with that would require you to, to navigate vertically on rope, you know, maybe hundreds of feet. Um, and so getting to access all of these bats in these sites and treat them is the challenge. Um, and so that is something that has really limited us. And we also don't want to go and do something in these sites that helps all the bats in these caves, but harms the actual cave environment and the other species that are utilizing these environments. Um, there are other rare uh, fish, salamanders, uh, insects, etc., 
um, in a lot of our caves. And so we don't want to help the bats and then harm everything else. Um, and then just the logistic feasibility of accessing these sites. And unfortunately, it's not like we could just go in the summer, say, when the bats aren't there um, and treat them because the, the bats will bring the fungus back with them. Um, they carry it on their fur um, and they also will bring it into a site and it will persist. So the fungus can lay dormant in the um, soil substrate or wood substrate within sites and just sit there and for the bats to return. Um, so it has certainly been a challenge. Um, obviously, we have not stopped bite nose. You guys saw our map. Um, and so what we're trying to do is work on trying to limit uh, other threats to our bats as well as limit the spread of the disease where it currently is not. Um, so we do a lot of decontamination of gear and talking to people that go um, use these sites like cavers. Um, and so that has kind of been our our, our big focus and then um, selectively trying to treat bats in certain instances when we're able to do so. Um, so in Georgia, um, we're trying our best to um, combat this disease. So um, we go out in the winter and we survey these sites um, to assess what species are impacted, how bad the impacts are, um, and work with collaborators, as I mentioned, to try and uh, protect some of these sites um, so you can see we do a lot of uh, winter cave and uh, transportation culvert surveys because, as I mentioned, the bats will hibernate there. A lot of the spread of the fungus that we have seen further south in Georgia, because we do not have caves in South Georgia, is in our transportation structures. And so that has really been a big emphasis for us in monitoring. Um, and once again, these are even tied to water. A lot of our caves are built because of having water going through them, um, and bats are tied to um, having these damp human conditions within these sites so they don't dehydrate because they're very susceptible to that. Um, and then of course, the reason we have uh, transportation structures on our roadways, such as culverts and bridges, is to move water through these sites. Um, and so um, when we've been going out and visiting these sites, one of the other things that we do when we're at a bridge or culvert is actually look at um, aquatic uh, passage, uh, like for fish, and we're working to help capture that data while we're visiting sites and kind of hit two birds with one stone during our visits. Um, in the summer, we do a, a variety of things. We go out and capture bats with mist nets. So you can see that big uh, net there in my image. We have a big pulley system. This thing can be 18 meters wide and nine or 10 meters tall. They can be quite large if we want them to be. Um, and we'll capture bats. And from there, we're able to collect biometric data on them, such as their uh, age, reproductive status, sex, uh, species, of course. Um, we could put a tag on them so we could track them and see where they're moving. Um, in particular, for our migratory species, this is of interest with, for us. Um, the image you see in the bottom left, we're outside of a maternity cave and we're trying to assess if the females are reproducing well um, as they fly out of that site. We'll capture them. Um, the other thing that we do is we use acoustic monitoring. So capturing bats is very labor intensive, as I mentioned, um, having the rabies exposure vaccine, as well as just having all of this gear and going out and visit sites. And bats are not easy to capture. Um, I have, can stand in front of my mist nets and see a bat fly up and turn around and fly the other way, fly over my net, fly around my net. Um, they can see they are not blind. So nights when the moon is really bright are not as good for us capturing bats. They also have their echolocation. Um, and so I try my best to uh, trick them and capture them, but they are very elusive. Um, and so it can be very intensive and using acoustic monitors, so that's what that yellow thing is there in that image, um, is a really great tool because it's a lot more passive. So what we can do is um, deploy these on a, on a tree somewhere stationary and record calls and look at when the bats are active, what species are in an area, or we can drive mobile transects um, so that we can record data and see what habitats the bats are tending to use. Um, and so those are really good sources of information for us. And we have um, uh, software programs that help us analyze the data that we collect from this method. And then all of this information that we are collecting from missetting for bats, acoustic surveys, the winter cave surveys, um, and all of that is being um, input to something called the North American Bat Monitoring Program. It is run by the U.S. Geological Survey, and it is um, trying to understand trends for our bat species throughout their ranges, because bats don't pay attention to a state line and they go wherever they want. 
Um, and so it's really hard for some of these species that do migrate so far or, or cross boundaries and occur in multiple states um, to really determine how healthy these populations are, how many bats we have. Um, and so uh, all of the states contributing their data to that effort and universities doing projects on bats, et cetera, um, federal agencies and all of the data being submitted to that is then able to be analyzed to help answer some of these bigger questions about how our bats are doing. Um, back at home in Georgia, one of the other things we like to do is provide education. So I was happy to come talk to your group today uh, about bats and, and why we care about them and what we can do to help them because I think many people um, misunderstand bats. Um, I, I meet some people that love bats and are excited about them. I meet a lot of people that think, like I said, they're, they're scary or they're dirty or that just maybe they're not around. Um, and I think it's because you don't see them like you see a lot of other wildlife. And a lot of people think of, love to see birds, right? You can see birds, you can hear birds. Um, they're very visible. Um, and bats, you don't hear them. It's because of their echolocation calls, which are unique to species. Um, are at a frequency that is above human hearing. Um, now they can make some noises that humans can detect that are in our uh, range of hearing, but a lot of the calls that they're making are above the frequency you can hear. And that is why you don't hear them like you do birds, but they do have unique calls to their species and they have social calls where they're communicating with each other. And there are some bats that do um, provide care for other bats, such as vampire bats actually will take care of elderly bats and come and bring them uh, food. Um, and we have some bats that form other social groups. Um, so they're quite interesting in some of their behavior. Um, and we just like to get out and talk to people about um, how they benefit us and uh, why they think, uh, why maybe they should think bats are maybe a little more interesting or beneficial than they thought before. Um, and then there's a few things that you can do. Um, so one of the things that you can do is put up a bathhouse. Um, so if you put up a bat house, you might get a really cool video. Um, these are those Brazilian free-tailed bats that I was talking about earlier in that Douglas barn. I think they're very cute. I do realize I'm biased, but um, he does a little yawn there for you as he's just hanging out with his friends in a bat house. Um, so we have been trying to put up some bat houses around different state parks, um, but and there's information on the DNR website about that. Um, but that's a great thing that you can do for bats is put up a bat house. Um, Another thing that you can do is provide fresh drinking water. So as I mentioned earlier, bats are concerned with water quality um, in terms of their, their health, and they're very tied to water in terms of the habitats that they live in and that they like to feed along. Um, and so having water available for these guys is very important, um, especially as we get near the coast and fresh water can be a limiting factor, you know, on some of our islands or, or really close to the coast where um, there's a lot of marshy habitat that's kind of brackish water or salt water. Um, so fresh drinking water is very beneficial. Um, another thing is to plant native plants. Um, so we have a whole list on our website of native plants that you can uh, plant in your yard that will attract some of these insects that our bats like to eat, um, some of the moths and beetles um, that they enjoy. Um, and of course, native plants are beneficial for a whole host of other reasons for pollinators and a lot of other wildlife species. So I always encourage people to consider planting native. Um, you can also keep cats indoors. So if you have any outdoor cats, um, they can be very uh, harmful to a lot of uh, wildlife, not just bats, but um, other small mammals and birds, etc. Um, so I always encourage people to try their best to keep their cats indoors. Um, and then finally, you can volunteer for our acoustic program. So the reason I'm talking to you today is one of my volunteers, uh, Janet, actually asked me to come speak to your group because um, Janet goes every summer and helps collect data for us. Um, and so what that looks like is I have acoustic detectors and I have a, a training video and we put them at different um, parks around the state of Georgia. And then I have designated uh, driving routes and my volunteers like Janet and other folks around the state go out and drive with that equipment on their vehicle and collect that data for us because there is me and one other person that does bats for the state of Georgia. Um, so we are very limited in, in how many people we have to, to do this work full time. Now I can hire you know, people to help me from here to there, but I just don't have the capacity to go out and sample all of these areas. And so having more people to assist us with this is so beneficial. And that data we then analyze and get those species IDs and we submit that to the North American Bat Monitoring Program that I talked about. So it's very beneficial for us. And it's something we do every summer in June or July. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those about that. 
Um, and then finally, you can purchase a George DNR um, license plate for the wildlife conservation section. As I mentioned, we are the section that's in charge of all of our non-game species. So we have folks that do sea turtles and right whales. We have people that do bald eagles, uh, hellbenders, which are a type of salamander, um, et cetera. So uh, we actually have four botanists on staff that do a lot of work with our um, rare plant species across the Georgia because there's a lot more of them than there are the rare animals actually. So um, we um, try and really focus on a lot of those um, species that are um, maybe not doing so well. A lot of the rare and endangered species are tend to be the ones that we spend the most time on. Um, but yeah, that's it. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I know people maybe put some in the chat and I'll look at that here in just a moment where I'm happy for folks to hop on and ask questions. I have my contact info there if anybody has any, any further questions they want to get into later. Um, and I'm happy for my email to be shared as needed for folks. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and take a look at the comments. And if anybody wants to, you know, raise their hand or drop in and ask something, I'm happy to answer that as well. Okay. I am looking at, I see Elijah sent a photo of a bat. You know, um, it does look like that. So actually the, um, Elijah, the photo that you provided of that bat on that leaf, um, I think I would say that looks to be one of two species, either the Northern yellow bat, um, but I actually think it could also be a tricolored bat. I would need to see a better image of its face. They both have that yellowish cur uh, colored fur as well as tricolor bats in particular are known to have a pink form that you can see that's kind of bent up. So I would be suspicious of one of those two species because it's on a tree branch like this. Um, I would lean maybe towards a yellow bat because that's more um, typical for that species, but um, I would need to get a better look at it to tell you which one it is. But it's likely one of those two. And they're, those are both species that we're concerned about in Georgia, either at the, the state level or the federal level. So um, they're, either way, it's a great bat to have um, on your property. And hopefully he was doing OK. Um, Chris Adam thinks the Banks Lake bats are little brown myotis. Um, so. I um, actually get a lot of people that um, ask me about little browns, and that's because they are little bats that are brown. And I know that name is confusing. We have big brown bats and little brown bats, and all of the bats are kind of littleish and, and brown. Um, so it's not very helpful in terms of the, the common name for these species. But um, I would say it's very likely that it is not a little brown bat, um, just because um, Little brown bats are quite rare. I think the last one we saw that we've been able to confirm in Georgia was eight or nine years ago um, and almost always in North Georgia in our caves. Um, I don't know that we've ever had a detection in this part of the state that we've been able to confirm. Now, never say never, bats do fly. Sometimes they show up in places we don't expect. And the little brown bat is actually, um, the genus for that is Myotis. You can see uh, in the comment there, Myotis lucifugus. And myotis bats are, um, there's multiple species of myotis bats in the state of Georgia, and they are known to be incredibly difficult to differentiate. Um, and so even acoustically, their calls are very similar. And then in hand, we have to look at things like the length of their toe hairs and the shape of the trachis in their ears to differentiate those species. So um, it could be that this is another myotis, like myotis austroriparius, that southeastern bat I mentioned, and that's what I would more be suspicious of in that um, area is the southeastern myotis. But um, it could be, um, you know, I would have to go and actually have a bat in hand to verify that. Um, but I get a lot of people asking me about little browns because they're all little and they're all brown. So uh, that's a very common thing that comes up. Um, what time of year do you see the Douglas bats and also Banks Lake? So Banks Lake, I have never been to Banks Lake to see the bats, but I assume it's in the summer. Um, when probably I would assume anywhere, this is a guess, anywhere from May to August, you probably could see them is my guess. But for those of you that go on the paddle, maybe you can answer that for us when you've seen them there. Shirley and Kim, what's your answer to that question? Kim is the uh, main leader of the Banks Lake paddles these days. 
Um, I would say, you know, I haven't been paying attention, but almost always we see some bats throughout the year at Banks Lake. Um, sometimes there's a few of them that come out and sometimes there's hundreds. Um, yeah. But nearly all year. That doesn't surprise me. Um, in southern Georgia, it just is never really that cold and there's almost always insects on the landscape that we very rarely see bats not active. It has to be really cold, dead of winter, like your, like the comment that was made, um, that I would expect them to not really be very active in the area. And I'm assuming the population when it's increasing is probably that maternity colony that could be on site um, in the middle of summer, maybe is probably likely when it's at peak. Um, same thing with the Douglas bats. Um, I have had people send me videos of them in September and October, as well as, um, you know, in April identifying them there. I think the best time to see them is going to be May to August. Um, but you could go, I mean, you could go tonight, I'm sure, and see them um, out there if you wanted to. They're going to come out right around sunset. I would arrive probably 20, 30 minutes before sunset and 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 you can take a look. Um and see them. There's a, a fence, you know, you can't go inside of it and everything, but you can, you can stand there and observe them, I'm, I'm sure. Um, and so that's really the peak time when we see bats being active because that's when those mothers are having pups and they're having to go feed every day and take care of them. Um, but in, um, especially as you get closer and closer to the coast, um, we expect bats to be active almost year round. I had people catching bats in February last year on the coast. Um, so it is, very likely, as long as it's a warm day, they're probably flying, um, even further north. Um, a couple of questions. Oh, yes. Okay. So at the Douglas Colony, uh, I was there when uh, the gentleman had come up to observe them because he could see them on radar. Uh-huh. And he told me that it was the largest colony in the southeast. Would you agree? Yeah, so that's our suspicion. I don't like... I don't always say that because I don't have any way to verify that number. Um, it's definitely our largest colony in the state of Georgia. Um, and from talking to other local state bat biologists, I believe it could be um, the largest in the Southeast. I just don't have a, because I don't have a good way to count it. Um, I don't have a, a, a verified way to confirm that, but I would not be surprised. It is a very large colony. Okay, I have another question. Um, yeah. So you, there's a million bats in that warehouse that have been there for years. Maybe, and years. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, they've yeah. been years and years and years. What does the owners of the warehouse do with all that droppings? So um, from my understanding, they it's what they do in that warehouse is have piles of fertilizer. And so the bats are just adding fertilizer to their fertilizer and their droppings, which a lot of people actually plant, put bat houses in their gardens because their guano is such a great fertilizer. It used to be harvested like in South America, people would go harvest bat guano as a garden fertilizer because it is such a good fertilizer. So I think it just gets sprinkled in and it helps fertilize all the stuff they're sending out is my assumption. That's, that's good to know. I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's of some use because I know when they were doing the um, renovation on the outside, they had sort of bulldozed yeah. some piles of it out beside the building. And it made me wonder, like, I mean, oh, mm -hmm. okay over all these years because that's a very old colony yes so i just wonder yeah it is um and i mean there's I, i've been in that barn to try and get a look at them and they're really i mean that's a huge barn like it's not like a typical like a barn on someone's house i mean it is a very big structure um and so it, they're probably I don't know, 50 feet in the air. They're pretty high up there. And so it's, um, they're all, they're in all these little cracks up there where there's like two wood slats coming together and they're just lined beside each other, probably a couple stacked deep um, in there. And that's what we see a lot in other things like in our bridges, that's what they'll do in joints of the roads and stuff. So um, I'm not surprised and I'm sure um, there, I mean, I, I would love to get a better count on it and I'm gonna try and go um, maybe this next spring and and, use a different camera and see if we can get a better better idea of it because I would really like to have a better number because um, it's it's a lot. It is. I have one <laughs> last question. So I've stepped inside there too, but it was like a bright day outside. I stepped uh -huh. inside and I looked up and like you say, the building's so large, I couldn't see the, I couldn't see because it was, you know, the ceiling was dark. So did you right. use some kind of lights to 
Yeah, so I had brought a really bright spotlight to look up in there and see where they were. And I'm um, just from looking at the structure, I had a good idea that they were probably in those um, those thin joints. And there's also, though, an area in there, at least the last time I was in there, which was before the renovation. I haven't been inside since, just outside. Um, there was like a almost like a lofted um, area within the barn and a lot of bats I could hear them were above that lofted area but I couldn't get to where I could see them um because I mean those fertilizer piles are like I don't know 20 feet tall they're very big so I couldn't get to actually see where the bats were in that, that lofted area but I could just hear them um there there was so many of them up in there so um, they're probably using slightly different parts of the structure just depending on how many there are in there um, in the weather. So maybe, you know, when it gets really hot, they're not in the very top part of the barn where it's as hot and they're kind of going to areas that are a little cooler, maybe getting more airflow and they're probably switching around where they are um, just based on that, which we see a lot with like bat houses and things. Bats will kind of move where they're roosting. Yeah. Um, in the comments, I see Suzanne said she had a bat house um, but no takers. So that is actually a common issue that we have with bat houses, um, where people put a bat houses, they don't get bats. Um, and I wish I had a great solution for you. I've had people ask me, is there something I can buy to put in there? Um, and really the answer is no. The biggest thing to keep in mind is make sure your bat house is a good design. So I've seen bat houses that are sold on like Amazon and places like that, that are not actually the design that we would recommend. We would recommend a bat house that is multiple chambers um, and each opening should only be three quarters of an inch. Um, so the DNR website has plans. If you wanna build your own, they have links to places you can buy kits to put together or a fully made bat house. Um, but that's one big thing where I see people putting up bat houses that are not quite the design the bats are really gonna look out for. Um, the other thing is the height of your bat house. So the taller, the better. Um, ideally, the minimum height I would recommend is 12 feet off the ground. Getting it closer to 15 to 20 is even better because when those moms are pregnant and she has that big, heavy baby, um, she has a really far away she's going to drop before she can safely fly out of that roost. And so you need to have that height um, for that reason and also safety from predators getting in houses. I've sometimes seen like black rat snakes go up and get bats out of houses, which brings me to my next point of the location of the house in terms of um, the solar impacts it's going to get. So the bats tend to like houses that are, thank you, Janet, um, that are getting a lot of solar exposure. We say anywhere from six to eight hours a day. Morning sun is better. Um, and so if you put it on um, a tree, which a lot of people do, they'll put it on like a, a hardwood tree or a pine tree in their yard because it's easy. And I agree it is way easier than putting a post up in your yard. Um, but what that's going to do is cause a lot more issues in terms of predators likely to find that um, house being on that tree. And it's also going to cause um, generally a lot more shading on the tree unless you have like a a pine tree with a tall canopy and it's in it like on a hill or something where it's going to get that good solar exposure of those six to eight hours. Um, because when those bat pups are born, they're not very good at thermoregulation and their natural body temperature is over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And so they really like a really warm place. Um, and so those are the things I would keep in mind is making sure you have a design, you have the height right, you have the placement right. Um, I generally recommend it being maybe 15, 20 feet off of like a forest edge. So you're not getting shaded out by the forest canopy as much. Um, and so those are all on our DNR website, all of those suggestions, as well as, like I said, links for places to buy them, et cetera. Um, and then the last thing would be if you have a house that has been out, go take a look at it. Sometimes mud daubers will build nests in there or um, things like that. And then there's nowhere for the bats to root. So you may have to periodically clean it out. You can get like a, if there's no bats in there, you could hose it out maybe in the winter uh, so that you're not going to get maybe stung by things if there's an, an, a thing, an insect uh, up in there. But um, that's one thing that I would also watch for because that does happen. Um, but otherwise, um, I had it take a couple years for bats to occupy houses just because some people say they like them to get kind of old and gross first. So I've had bats move into houses that have been out for three years. Um, but I mean, sometimes, yeah, I put out the perfect house. Nobody moves in. Sometimes I put up a terrible looking house. And they're there. So they don't always do what I think they're going to do. So best of luck. Um, a couple of local 
plants that you can recommend. Um, we have that native plant list and I would have to look at that to see some of the specific ones that are found um, in that area. I can um, get you a link to the native plant list. I mean, certainly, um, you know, having uh, trees in your area, like the, the oak trees and stuff that they can have leaves to hold on to, pine trees, et cetera, are helpful. Um, but I would need to look at our list to give you a specific uh, idea of that. So I'll look at that in a little bit and give you um, a link to that. Where can we find more information on volunteering? Thank you again, Janet. Uh, so yeah, we have a, a, that project page and you can email me if you wanna volunteer for the that acoustic program and I can help provide info for that. I usually reach out to folks in the spring to get that going. We just finished uh, August is when our season ends for that survey period. Um, and then Georgia Dinar has other volunteer opportunities of course for other events. Um, so I'll paste in that um, native plant list here in just a moment. Um, but did anyone else have any other questions? Or is that everybody? How do we make these bats as famous as the Austin bats? I used to live in Austin, so, you know, I think of that. Yeah. Um, so I think what we need to do is get a better idea of how many there are and actually see, is this actually the largest colony in the Southeast like we think it might be? And if so, then I think that could kind of be their, their tout to fame. Um, and, you know, we've, we the landowner that owns the barn, you know, they're aware that people come and look at those bats. Um, but if it wanted to be, you know, in Austin, it's a whole event, right? There's people selling bat equipment and things like that. It's like a, a big tourist attraction. It's it's kind of well known and vendors have taken advantage of it. So, I mean, it would really have to be, you know, maybe putting up some sort of like observation deck and signage. Like, I mean, to increase people's awareness of it and kind of get it on some of the like, you know, Travel Georgia websites, you know, you would really have to promote it, I assume, just because not many people find themselves, you know, most people traveling to Georgia are like on I-75 or 16 or something and not going through Douglas. So we would really have to kind of make people aware of it. But I think people are interested. I get a lot of people that are just like, how can I go look at bats? Especially, you know, school groups are like, Boy Scout, Girl Scout type of groups, um, you know, Master Naturalist, those are all organizations that seem to have, a, you know, an interest in that type of thing. Um, I talk to a lot of uh, bird groups. Um, so if you guys know people that are big birders and they have like an Audubon club, like those are all great ways to get people that are interested in that type of um, event to get out there. And then, um, you know, I, we would really probably need to talk to the landowner about, you know, promoting it at that level and, and getting more people out there because you're still um, you know, it's, there's some, there's a lot of roads in that area in terms of where people are going to park and things like that. So, I mean, there's more logistics to figure out with it, but, um, sounds so. like an opportunity for a Georgia outdoor stewardship program grant. Oh, I know. Right. Um, maybe we can get a better count on it and then we can, you know, put a stamp on it. Biggest colony in the Southeast and then maybe <laughs> go from there, but that is a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. Are the bats at Banks Link also in the Okefenokee? Yes, those are probably the same species that are in the Okefenokee. I think we do have a little more survey data of bats in that area. I know we definitely have acoustic data. I believe Janet actually runs a route over near there. Um, and so I would need to go look at some of that information. But yeah, those um, eight species definitely, I would assume, would be in that area. And there's a couple more, um, some of the like migratory species that I get reports of that maybe just are there for you know, two, three, four weeks as they're passing through, like uh, the silver-haired bat is an example. I've gotten images of them in Brunswick when they're migrating through the state of Georgia in the fall and the spring. So I wouldn't be surprised if they might stop over in a place like that. So there's probably a couple more that we could consider um, in that area. Just maybe not as frequently. <laughs> the Any other Georgia questions? Bat I'm sorry? The Southeast Georgia Bat Tour. Oh, I know it would be fun. Um, I mean, especially go going out like you guys uh, have the the paddles on Banks Lake. Like I said, I've never been, but I, I was looking at photos of it for this presentation and it looks beautiful. Um, and I have gone and paddled in the Okefenokee and that was a wonderful time. So I think if we could tie it into there, that would be great. Um, so some exciting potential. Um, and I mean, some of the bad acoustic detectors are getting more affordable and um, you know, getting people are getting interested in doing like night hikes and having uh, you could, you know, bring a tablet and show people it'll suggest species IDs and things like that. And um, 
the uh, companies often do um, like small grants for things like that and stuff too. So it might be something to consider to get people out. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you for coming. Sarah's got to run across town to her next meeting. Yeah. No, thank you all for having me. And please uh, reach out if anybody has any questions. I appreciate the invite. Uh, thank you, Janet, for making it happen. And I had fun talking with y'all. Thank you. This was very informative. I enjoyed it a lot. We might have to oh, have good. you on. <laughs> <laughs> I love talking about that. So no problem at all. Okay. Well, yes. Thanks, everybody. And hope everyone has a good rest of your day. All right. You guys. Tell all your friends the video will be up soon. Okay. I will. Yes. I'm sure our public affairs staff will love to have that link. So I'll let them know whenever y'all have it posted. All righty. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Have a good day. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.